Well, good day, everyone. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us. And Lord, right now we ask that you would do what no man, no woman can do, and that is to bring transformation through the preaching of your word. You are the one who does that by your spirit. And so we long for your instruction today, and we long for the change that only you can bring. Help us to uh, see and to savor the richness that is contained in your word, and may this drive us to deeper love and deeper worship of you. Would you fix our eyes, fix our gazes on all that you are doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, last week we paid close attention to Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 4. And we discovered a valley of dry bones that was brought to life as the prophet Ezekiel preached the word of the God, preached the word of God by the Spirit of God. There are a number of important details on these verses worth paying attention to. So if you weren't able to join us last week, I'd encourage you to read Ezekiel 37 or maybe revisit that chapter or sermon which can be found online. Because what we discover through a careful study of that passage is that new life is found in Jesus Christ. And so last week we were called to trust in Christ for new life, to preach this Christ till He returns and to depend on Him daily for the works of transformation. Today we arrive at the final nine chapters of Ezekiel, and you might be wondering, Eliot's sermons are usually long enough already. Will today's sermon be done by Christmas? He takes 45 minutes to preach through a few verses. I'm not liking the odds of nine chapters. I haven't brought enough food and drink to last that long. Well, you see, the reason we are looking at nine chapters is because Ezekiel 40 to 48 forms one literary unit that communicates three main themes. One literary unit that communicates three main themes. These three main themes can be found in point one of the outlines, and we'll look at each of these in detail in just a moment. But it's also because Ezekiel 40 to 48 is set against the background of great wickedness. Great wickedness. The wickedness is not only the great evils committed against the Israelites, that's certainly true, it's also the great evils that the Israelites committed against God. We read some of that in our passage. And the great evils that Israel committed against one another. And what Ezekiel 40 to 48 does is it lifts our gazes to God, to, to what God is doing and to what will happen in the very end. You know, we also live in a world filled with wickedness, which is why today we need the very same message of hope. And this is what Ezekiel 40 to 48 gives to us an image of all things being restored. Now, obviously, we won't be able to go through all nine chapters in great detail. So what we'll do instead is give our attention to the five passages that were so helpfully read out for us because these five chapters exemplify uh, what the nine chapters are all about. If you have the outlines, you'll see that we'll explore these chapters under three sections. Number one, the restoration of Israel. Number two, the radiance of the sun. Number three, the reordering of new Israel. The restoration, the radiance, and the reordering. And through these points, we will see that wickedness will come to an end at the return of Jesus Christ. Wickedness will come to an end at the return of Jesus Christ. Let's begin at point one, the restoration of Israel. And I'd like to draw your attention to the first reading we had today, Ezekiel 40, verses 1 to 9. As you turn to that passage, you'll hopefully see, hopefully see in your outlines that chapter 40 to 48 can be divided into three main sections. And together, these show us what the future will look like. Broadly, section 1 is found in chapters 40 to 43, which speak about the return of God's presence. Section 2 is found in chapters 43 to 46, which speak about the restoration of the temple system and worship. Section 3 is found in chapters 47 to 48, which speak about the recovery of God's people. And these three main themes hold all nine chapters together. They are like hooks for us. And so keep this in mind as we jump from chapter to chapter. Chapter. 
As we begin in the first theme, the return of God's presence found in Ezekiel 40 verses 1 to 9. And here, if you start from verse 1, we're told that Ezekiel is on a high mountain. He meets an angelic figure and he is given a vision of a temple. And what you'll notice from verse 5 onwards and basically for the next four chapters is detailed measurements of what this temple ought to look like. I'm not going to reread it for us, uh, but you know, I'm not an engineer, I'm not an architect, I'm not a designer, so it's actually quite hard for me to conceptualize or imagine what this looks like. But if you wanted, you could actually draw the layout of this temple based on the measurements given in these chapters. You could use a piece of paper or one of those fancy softwares like Rhino 30 or AutoCAD. And if you did, you'll notice that there is perfect geometric symmetry in this temple. It's actually absolutely stunning. Now the question we have to ask is, why is the vision of this temple important and significant? Further, what's with the seemingly tedious detail? Well, here's the thing. You and I know that buildings represent something. Buildings represent something. They are not unimportant. For example, we are just days away from the U.S. elections right now. And it doesn't matter who wins. We know that the president will live and work in the White House. That building represents political, economic, and perhaps even military power. It represents the presence of the president. It is absolutely unmissable. Almost anyone in the world will look at the White House and immediately think, ah, the President of the United States. It's a powerful symbol. Buildings represent something. And so the temple of the Old Testament had a similar effect on the Israelites. The temple was a place of worship, but it also represented God's presence because the temple was the place where God chose to dwell. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that when God is in the temple, He is not elsewhere. The Bible tells us God is omnipresent. He is all-present. He is everywhere. He's not confined by walls. Yet the temple, along with the temple sacrificial system, is a vivid and tangible expression of God's presence with God's people. The temple and the temple sacrificial system is a vivid and tangible expression of God's presence among God's people. So that every time you see it, every time you come close to it, every time you worship in it, you know that God is with you. Now here's the problem we face. Because of the exile and the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple where God dwells no longer existed. So this doesn't only mean that their whole system of worship was in jeopardy. Significantly, it also meant that the presence of God itself was in question. Where would God make His presence known? The temple is no longer there. Where else can we turn? But by painting a vision of a perfect and holy temple here with specific dimensions and instructions, Ezekiel 40 to 43 is telling us, a rebuilding is taking place. God intends on dwelling and living with His people again. So sure enough, our second reading, Ezekiel 43, verses 1 to 12, tells us this is exactly what happens in the vision. The glory of the Lord with sounds like roaring, rushing waters enters the temple through the gate facing the east. God's glory and God's presence fills the temple. In this glorious vision, the presence of God that was previously absent has now returned. We'll come to why this is important in just a moment. But before that, let's have a look at our second theme, the temple system. That brings us to our third reading, Ezekiel 43, verses 18 to 27. And here, the vision brings us into the premise of the temple. And the average Old Testament believer would have known exactly what this scene is about. A sacrifice is taking place. Now, sacrifice was a key feature in the life of God's people because it symbolized the forgiveness of sins. Sacrifice symbolized the forgiveness of sins. Why is that? 
Well, you see, the Bible makes it clear that the price or the consequence of sin is death. And of course, death is most vividly expressed in the spilling of blood. That's one of our primary instincts when we see blood, right? We detect the presence of death. We don't just see it, we can sometimes smell it. The Bible teaches that all of humanity is sinful because we have turned our backs against God. God made us, yet in our pride and arrogance, we say, God, I don't need you. And so because of our sin, every human deserves death. That is just, that is fair punishment. Because of our hubris, we deserve this death. But you see, The Bible also tells us that God in His kindness, another word we use is grace, instituted a system that will allow animals or different kinds of offerings to be sacrificed in the place of sinful human beings. In other words, these animals, whether they are bulls or goats in our passage or other types of offerings can be substitutes for the sins of those who offered them. These sacrifices stood in the place of those who brought these sacrifices. It was an atonement, an atonement, an amendment for our sins. This would take place annually, we see from the Old Testament, again and again, because the sins of humanity are also many. But you see, up to this point, remember, the temple had been destroyed It no longer existed. This meant that the entire temple sacrificial system was not functional. And if it is ineffective, it basically means that the sins of the Israelites could not be forgiven. And if their sins could not be forgiven, they cannot possibly worship God. This is why Ezekiel 43 verse 18 onwards is so important. Because what we see here is not just a regular sacrificial ceremony. Instead, this here that was read out to us earlier is a special seven-day sacrificial program. And the purpose of this special program is to consecrate and purify the altar for its original purpose. That is, to offer sacrifices for the sins of Israel. This passage here is a sort of a is a sort of an opening ceremony, if you will. This special sacrifice is taking place so that the altar in the temple can be restored and be used to make sacrifices to God. Now we're beginning to understand the significance of Ezekiel 43 even more, because now the temple is rebuilt. The altar is reinstated, it is consecrated and purified. All this means is that there is now a place for sacrificial offerings to be made. And so verse 27 tells us, after this week-long program of sacrifices, the priests are to offer burnt offerings and fellowship offerings on the altar. Then the sovereign Lord will say, then I will accept you. According to Ezekiel's vision, The temple is rebuilt. The temple system of sacrifice is restored, which means the forgiveness of sins and acceptance by God is now possible. New life, a second chance, a fresh start is here. Come with me to our fourth reading, Ezekiel 47, verses 1 to 8. Because this here beautifully illustrates the new life that forgiveness brings. In the vision, we are now back at the entrance of the temple. And now, visualize this with me, we see water coming out from under the thresholds of the temple. And the volume of this water is so great that it goes from knee deep to waist high and it increases until it ultimately covers the entire person so it is deep enough for someone to swim. And the extent of this water is so great that verse 8 tells us it goes all the way down to the Arabah and down into the Dead Sea. Here's the thing. Those of you who've been to the Dead Sea, maybe by traveling, you'll know that when you get there, your tour guide will tell you if you have an open wound, even if it's from shaving, do not swim in the Dead Sea. Why is that? The Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea because nothing lives in it. 
It is the deepest hypersaline lake in the world. It is 9.6 times as salty as a regular ocean. This means that no plant, no animal can survive in the Dead Sea. But here's what's amazing. In verse 8, we're we're told that the water flowing from the temple is so abundant that it turns the salty water, the hyper-salty water of the Dead Sea into fresh water. Verse 9 goes on to tell us living creatures begin to emerge and life begins to take place again. Oh, this is a powerful image of a restoration of new life. What we're seeing here is that the blood which flows from the altar of sacrifice leads to forgiveness, which then overflows into life-giving water. The blood which flows from the altar of sacrifice leads to forgiveness, which then overflows into life-giving water. This is the second theme in Ezekiel's vision. Let's come now and look at the third theme, God's people. And this brings us to our fifth and final reading, Ezekiel 48, verses 23 to 35. And here, if you remember, land is being allotted or divided to different tribes and different families, and a new city is being described. Something very interesting is going on here. Because part of Ezekiel's vision is not only new life and a fresh start, it is also a restoration of what life ought to look like under God. Now here's the thing. As we think about the theme of wickedness, what we discover in these nine chapters in Ezekiel, again, is not only that the Israelites were victims of wickedness, that's certainly true, but perhaps more significantly, they were also perpetrators. They were doers of wickedness. In other words, not only were the Israelites suffering from wickedness that people were doing against them, the Israelites themselves are also committing acts of wickedness. Firstly, against God, by worshipping idols, by turning their backs against God. But they also committed acts of wickedness and sinned against one another by coveting what was not theirs through greed expressed in shady business dealings. Wickedness by oppressing those who are weak and vulnerable. But you see, according to this vision and the hope of restoration, these things were not to be. God's people were now to treat one another differently. How differently? Well, these passages on the allotment of land gives us four principles of how God's people were to live together. Four principles. Firstly, there is to be a commitment to equality, a commitment to equality. When you open up Ezekiel 40 to 48 over the course of this week, and as you in your own homes read the details about the way land is to be divided, you'll notice that there is now a return to the original vision of how land was to be allotted under Moses. And under this original system, land was to be divided in such a way that every household would have enough for economic viability. Every household would have enough for economic viability. Land division was not to favor the rich. It was not to marginalize the poor. There is to be fair and equitable distribution of land so that no one is disadvantaged. You'll notice, repeated through the passages, it says you are to divide it equally among them, equally among them. Everyone gets their fair share, a land that they could live on and a land that they could work and enjoy the fruits of their labor. Life in the future under God will be characterized by equality. Secondly, there is a commitment to security. Based on these passages, land was not only to be divided equally, more than that, Families have permanent ownership of their land without the threat of dispossession. They could have permanent ownership over their land. You see, historically, the rich could buy up other people's lands and build their own little empires, which would then cause the poorer families to suffer. This would be a major source of injustice. We understand this, right, where the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer. 
But in this vision, land will be divided equally and with permanence so that families and their subsequent generations could work their land and again enjoy the fruits of their labor without a threat of loss. Under this new vision, there will no longer be abuse in terms of land ownership. There will be security. Third, there is a commitment to inclusivity. There will be a commitment to inclusivity, and this here is stunning. Because if you pay attention to passages like Ezekiel 47, verses 22 to 23, you'll notice that Ezekiel calls not only for land to be given to Israelites, land was also to be given to foreigners or to non-Israelites living with the Israelites. Now, there's a sense in which this is not too surprising, right? Because the Old Testament consistently stipulates that foreigners or what they call resident aliens should be treated with care and support. Now, these foreigners were non-Israelites, but these foreigners were also those who were like widows, those who were orphans, those who were vulnerable. And this is stunning because it is akin to writing a non-family member into your family's will. Imagine if you are the wealthiest woman or man in the world, and strictly speaking, when you pass away, when you die, all of your wealth technically goes to your offspring, if you have any. But this commitment to inclusivity basically says non-family members can benefit from your wealth as well. That's amazing, isn't it? But this inclusivity is not just about including others in wealth. This ability to share in the inheritance of land also means that citizenship of foreigners is secure. There is no threat of being dispossessed again. All are included, not just the Israelites. Fourthly and lastly, life under this new vision is a commitment to sanctity. Sanctity. And by sanctity, we mean holiness. If you read these passages, you'll notice that this is a radically God-centered community. We see that in Ezekiel's vision, there is a central square called the holy place where God's presence dwelt and this permeated the rest of the land. And this symbolism is significant. God is at the center of their land. God is at the center of their living. God would cleanse their land of wickedness, making it holy and pleasing unto Him. And thus, God's people living in the land are also to be holy a light unto the neighboring nations. This is why the final verse of Ezekiel is critical. Ezekiel 48 verse 35, and Tom read it in a very deep, somber voice. It tells us the name of the city from that time will be, the Lord is there. God's presence will be the very center of the land. He will be the very center of the life of the people living in the land. Now, as we examine these three themes in Ezekiel 40 to 48, I suspect that many of you already sense and realize that these chapters are pregnant and loaded with theological significance. Call me to point two then, the radiance of the sun. Because one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, how is Ezekiel 40 to 48 fulfilled? Now, of course, there are a number of interpretations of how these nine chapters are fulfilled because, you see, We read in Ezra and Nehemiah that the temple of Jerusalem is later rebuilt. But we're also told that the glory of God did not fill the temple, as Ezekiel 43 describes. The river uh, did not fill the Red Sea as promised. If you go now, it's still there. What's more, equality, security, inclusivity, sanctity are unfortunately still not the markers of human existence today. Even today. Wickedness prevails. What's going on? When will this take place? Well, you see, what we realize through a careful examination of the symbols in Ezekiel 40 to 48 is that this year is a vision of the Messianic age to come. This year is a vision of the Messianic age to come. This is a vision of the future when Jesus comes back. But then you could say that there are multiple stages of this fulfillment. 
Because as we come to the New Testament, which illuminates what the Old Testament indicates, we see that the fulfillment of this presence, this forgiveness, and this fellowship is found perfectly in Christ and also at His return. It is found perfectly in Christ, but also perfectly at His return. There are multiple stages. Because here's the thing. When we think of God's presence, many of us immediately think of the famous Christmas passage, Matthew chapter 1, the opening book of the New Testament. This is the famous birth narrative speaking of the incarnation or the coming of Jesus Christ. Matthew 1 verse 23 tells us that this virgin-born son would come and he would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. The coming of Christ is a clear fulfillment of what it means for God to dwell with us, to be present with us. Hebrews chapter 1 is also another passage that many of us are familiar with. In particular, Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, The Son, referring to Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. Church, God's glory and God's presence dwells among us through Jesus Christ. And we must not miss this significance. Because you see, the people of God, the Israelites, they knew that the presence of God is all that they need. This is why the temple is so critical. Communion, relationship, intimacy with God trumps everything. We only need to read passages like Psalm 84 to understand this, right? I won't read the whole thing out for us, but you can turn there if you like. But in verses 1 to 2 of Psalm 84, it says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out to the living God. Notice that language. The language that says, I want nothing more than to be in the presence of God. Verses 4 to 6 then say, Blessed are those who dwell in your house, they are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, or the valley of weeping, they make it a place of springs, a place of life. The autumn rain also covers it with pools. Notice what's going on here. The psalmist longs to be in the dwelling place of the Lord because he knows that no harm, no hurt, no tragedy, no affliction could possibly overwhelm him as long as he is in the Lord's presence. It is there where he is safe. This was previously absent in the life of Israel as they remain in exile. But this glorious vision is saying God's presence will return at the rebuilding of this temple and the New Testament tells us it is here now in Jesus Christ. Church, every trouble, every worry, every anxiety, every hurt, every pain pales when we have the presence of God with us. And this is good news. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise of God's presence. But Jesus is also the fulfillment of the restoration of worship. Come with me to uh, point B of point two, because as we turn to the pages of the New Testament, particularly in the gospel writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what you'll also discover is that Jesus often alludes to himself as the temple of God. Matthew 26 Verses 61 is an example of this. Jesus says, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. This is puzzling. Isn't it? What does Jesus mean? Even his contemporaries are asking, what do you mean? But then passages like John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. John 2, verses 18 to 22 has a very similar quote and it tells us explicitly that the temple that Jesus is referring to is his body, which is going to die and be raised to life in three days. Jesus Christ is the perfect fulfillment of God's presence among us. Jesus is also the perfect temple. And we see this evidently not only in Jesus identifying as the perfect temple, we see this also clearly through the forgiveness of sins and the life that Jesus brings. Jesus. 
And so passages like Luke chapter 2, verse 11, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, and others makes it clear that Jesus Christ came into this world not only as a vivid expression of God's presence, but also as the Savior of the world, who through His life, death, and resurrection forgives sinners. Again, the language of atonement comes up again. And the word atonement basically means that Christ died in our place as the perfect sacrifice to pay for the penalty of our sin, which is death, so that you and I can be reconciled to God. Now again, it is easy for us to miss the significance of this because you and I, we live in a culture that largely rejects the idea of sin. And so we think it is fairly absurd to think that people should sacrifice things in order to be forgiven, let alone trust in Christ as the perfect sacrifice. What does that even mean? Why should I pursue forgiveness if I, if I don't even believe in sin? That's a valid question, isn't it? But you see, the concept of sin is not as foreign as we like to think. Now, biblically speaking, sin literally means to miss the mark, to fall short of God's glory, God's standards. Here at Grace Point, we describe sin as breaking God's law and betraying God's love. It is transgressing God's expectations for our lives. It is trampling on God's initiative to have a relationship with us. Now, that may sound complicated, but we actually understand the idea of sin a little better than we realize. You see, often our culture speaks of feeling shameful. And we don't like shame, right? We'll do anything to get rid of shame. We'll either hide shameful things about ourselves or we will attack people who make us feel ashamed. Shame is a consequence of sin and we carry this with us all the time. And you know, apart from hiding our shame or attacking people who make us feel ashamed, we actually don't know what to do with this sense of shame. We can bury it, we can push it away, but we actually don't know how to deal with it. Our culture also often speaks of feeling unclean or impure. In plays or dramas, we think of that bloody hand that can never be washed clean. In film, we think of the lead character who takes perpetual showers, perpetual baths, yet is forever unable to get rid of that sense of dirtiness. In music, we think of the lover who has betrayed their partner and drowns himself or herself in alcohol in hopes that the liquor can clean them from the inside and get rid of that sense of uncleanliness. Friends, this deep sense of uncleanliness is a consequence of sin, one that nothing can wash clean. You see, you can reject the idea of sin all we want, but there will always be a part of us that feels incomplete, like something is not right. Again, we can ignore it, bury it, we can entertain ourselves to death and forget about it, but it will never go away. The reality is sin haunts us everywhere we go, and what's more, sin will result in a greater judgment to come, the wrath of God. That's why the restoration of the temple system was a huge deal for Old Testament believers. That is why the coming of Jesus Christ changes everything. Because while the people of the Old Testament had to offer sacrifices again and again and again to atone for their sins, while many people today have to go through another high again and again, whether it is through career success, whether it is through relational pleasure, whether it is through escapism to numb that sense of shame, uncleanliness or purity, the Bible tells us today that Jesus is the perfect once for all sacrifice to forgive us of our sins permanently so that we can be made right with God and so that we can be made whole again. And so 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 tells us if we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And dear friends, this is offered to us all today. If you repent of your sin, of rejecting God and trust Him and said the Bible says you will be saved, you will be reconciled to God, and your life will begin to make sense again. New life is found 
It's amazing, isn't it? Forgiveness is tied up with the idea of new life, yeah? Remember Ezekiel 47? One of the features of this temple where sacrifices are made and where forgiveness is granted is an overflow of life-giving water, life-giving river. Some people have observed that this is a metaphor of what forgiveness brings, new life, and that's certainly true. But just as significantly, it also points us to Jesus Christ who in John chapter 19, verse 34, is hung on a cross. And upon being pierced in his side, blood and water flow from his side as a sign of new life that is found in him. This river, church, points to Jesus. Perhaps this is why in John chapter 4, verses 21 to 24, Jesus says, A time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, Jesus is saying worship is no longer confined to a physical location. Jesus says the worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And then in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, worship and forgiveness is now no longer focused on the temple. Jesus Christ is the temple in whom forgiveness and new life is found. But of course, The Bible also makes it clear that Jesus is the means through which we share in deep communion, not only with God, but also with one another. We come to union, fellowship. And perhaps the most famous passage on this is Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. You might know this off your heart already. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There are other passages as well. Romans 3, verse 22, Colossians 3, verse 11, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. I'm quoting all this just to tell you they're making the same point. Christians are all one in Jesus Christ, united to one another on account of our union with Jesus Christ. It's amazing, isn't it? Through our union with Jesus, believers share a union and a fellowship with each other that transcends not only blood relations, that transcends not only interests or politics. Church, the union we share with each other even transcends space and time. You and I share more with the Christian in Africa whom we've never met than with the non-believing neighbor next door. Can you imagine that? You and I share more in common with Martin Luther from over 500 years ago, whose life we commemorated yesterday. We share more with him than the non-Christian we met yesterday. Of course, this doesn't mean that we don't love or care for our friends and neighbors. We absolutely do. It is just that the union we have with fellow Christians in Christ is so strong that it makes all other relationships pale in comparison. As his children, we are all covered by the same blood, the same righteousness, the same costly sacrifice. That's what unites people together. You know, we, our, our culture and our world often laments the lack of peace, the lack of harmony in this world. And you know what? They will continue to lament this because their pursuit of peace and harmony is based on temporary, fragile things. Nothing can bind people closer to one another in deep fellowship than the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you see, remember that I mentioned earlier that there are multiple stages to this fulfillment. The first stage is the coming, the incarnation of Christ. And the second stage is the return of Christ. And so while the incarnate Christ is the fulfillment of these things, we also recognize that the climactic expression of presence, of forgiveness, and of life, and of fellowship is also not yet. We are still waiting, which is why when we turn to the book of Revelation, which speaks of the return of Christ, we see the new creation, the new heavens, described in similarly stunning detail as Ezekiel. For example, the symmetries in the descriptions of the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21 matches the symmetry that is found in Ezekiel 40 to 48. 
The river of life finds its fullest, fullest expression in Revelation 22 because here it flows to every corner and brings life and healing to the nations. And of course, in the book of Revelation, we see that God is at the very center of life in the new creation. And so you and I are now living in this age where the fulfillment of God's promise has come, but also not in whole. But you know, this fulfillment in Christ nevertheless shapes the way we live right now. Come with me to point three. Because by faith and repentance, you and I now belong to the new Israel, to the new people of God. And here, there is a reordering of priorities and concern, and we'll conclude with this today. The first of which is the pursuit of holiness. Holiness. You see, one of the things we discover from Ezekiel 40 to 48 is that God takes holiness seriously. We see this in the description of the temple. This building is like none other to communicate that our God is like none other. We see this in a sacrificial system. Sin is a transgression against a holy God, and so serious measures must be taken in order to be reconciled to Him. We see this in a way that new life in Him is ordered, right? God's people are to pursue holy and unique living so the world knows that we belong to Him. God is at the very center of our lives now, isn't He? And so it's the same for us today as Christians. Holiness. We've lost our sense of this, haven't we? J.C. Ryle, the 19th century um, Anglican bishop, says, Holiness is the habit of being of one mind with God, according as we find in His mind described in Scripture. He continues to say it is the habit of agreeing in God's judgment, hating what He hates, loving what He loves, and measuring everything in this world by the standard of His Word. That's so good, isn't it? It is aligning our thoughts, our wills, our desires to God's. That's what holiness means. To agree with what He agrees with, not to negotiate. It is to hate what He hates, not to compromise. It is to love what He loves, not to lower our standards. It is saying, God, everything you say is right and true. I assess everything according to the standard of your word. God takes holiness seriously, church, and so should we. The church, New Israel, ought to be a community that is radically centered around God and is to be known to be like God in terms of holiness. Of course, we pursue holiness not to win God's favor because that's already been given to us in Christ. But Ezekiel 40 to 48 is recovering for us the need to be unique, the need to be distinct. Men and women after God's heart who loves what He loves, who hates what He hates, and who pursues what He desires. Holiness. Another thing we observe from Ezekiel 40 to 48, read through the lens of the New Testament, is that forgiveness is offered freely in Jesus Christ. There is now no longer a question of whether forgiveness is offered or how forgiveness is offered. There is now no longer a need for regular sacrifice for sin. Christ has done it all. That's the good news. And this invitation is given to us to receive this today. We no longer need to carry our sin, our shame, our guilt, our uncleanliness with us anymore. Christ has paid for it on our behalf. And again, I just want to offer this forgiveness to you today if you don't know Jesus Christ. Jesus can cleanse you of your guilt and shame. Jesus can make you whole again. Jesus is the source and foundation of your hope and your joy. Turn from whatever you think is most important in your life and turn to Him instead. Next, we see in Ezekiel 40 to 48 that God's people who have new life in Him are to be characterized by harmony and unity. Harmony and unity. The gospel doesn't only impact our vertical relationship with God. It overflows into horizontal relationships, the way we live as members of God's church. Because you see, if there is any foundation for equality, security, inclusivity, and sanctity, then it has to be found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
The gospel which says we are all equal, equally sinful, but also equally saved through repentance and faith in Christ. The gospel which says we are all secure, nothing can separate us from the love of God. The gospel which says all are included. Doesn't matter what your background is, your gender, doesn't matter how much you feel like you've messed up, doesn't matter how good you think you are, everyone can be included in God's family because it is on account of Jesus Christ. The gospel says we are all holy. Not because we're inherently good or worthy or better than anyone else, but because we are covered by the blood of Christ. We are washed clean. We are made holy. You see, friends, without the gospel, we can totally understand why people will be out for their own gain. Without the gospel, greed, pride, oppression, wickedness, they all make sense. Because if the point of human existence is to watch out for ourselves or for our immediate friends and family, then what's the point of kindness and generosity? What's the point of equality, security, inclusivity, and sanctity? The gospel is the grounds. Because it says that we are worse than we can ever imagine, but more loved than we can ever hope for. This is the grounds where it is possible to treat everyone as equals to not intrude on another's security, to reach out to the marginalized. This is the grounds upon which emulating God's holiness makes sense. Life under Christ is radically God-centered and other person-centered, and this is an encouragement for us today to keep pursuing harmony and unity with each other. And lastly, we wait patiently and eagerly for Christ's return. Full restoration is still on its way. We've been given a glimpse of what it looks like. And and just based on this, we're told it's going to be glorious. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be good. And so our hopes and our expectations right now is not that we can eradicate wickedness and evilness on our own. We are awaiting a final restoration. We are awaiting Christ's return. Church, since Christ has come to forgiveness of our sins and to purge us of our wickedness, let us pursue holy lives. Let us receive forgiveness, maybe for the first time today. Let us live in harmony and unity with one another. And of course, lastly, let us wait eagerly for Christ's return because wickedness will come to an end at the return of Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you for this rich vision that captures our imagination and lifts us to a place where we can look beyond the wickedness and the brokenness and the sinfulness of this world. We thank you that you've painted for us a beautiful image of what the future of the Christ looks like and our hearts long for that day. Often our hope is based on material, current, temporary solutions, whether they be political, economic, medical, or whatever it is. And these things are good and wonderful, and we thank you for these things. But Lord, help us to long more than anything else for the return of Christ, where restoration is complete. Our gracious God, we thank you that this work is done in Christ already, that this sense of wholeness and fulfillment and joy and restoration can be found as we trust in you. But Lord, we also eagerly await. Lord, our hearts are just filled with anticipation and hope for the day where you return and make all things right again. So Lord, help us to be people characterized by an eager expectation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.